Today I'm going to talk about one of the uh, products that we're building, which is also an idea uh, called Eigenlayer. Uh, we call Eigenlayer the restaking collective. But what it does is enable anybody to add new features to Ethereum. Uh, as Tim introduced, I'm associate professor at the University of Washington, Seattle, where uh, we've been working on blockchains, consensus, and other stuff over the last four and a half years. And over the last year, I've been only building the startup layer lab. We've done a lot of work on consensus protocols. Um, you know, we had this paper called Everything is a Race, which analyzes conditions under which a proof of work, proof of stake, proof of space, any of these longest chain type protocols, when they're stable, when, when are they secure. Uh, we built on top of some of that understanding, you know, we have a paper called PRISM, which is a proof of work protocol which has very low latency. The, uh, the other work we did is called POSAT, which is, you know, how do you create a dynamically available proof of stake protocol. Dynamic availability means your protocol continues to work under variable participation. We also did a bunch of other stuff, you know, for example, when are blockchains accountable? Uh, one heuristic that we have is when you have quorums and signatures, then you know if, if, a co if a group of stakers double sign on a block, then th such blockchains are accountable. But there is some more subtleties to this. For example, a protocol like Algorand, which is also uses quorums and stuff, is not accountable because it relies on some other timing assumptions where you can create safety violations by not speaking anything. So we did an analysis on, on some of those things. Uh, the uh, two most recent works in this space have been on uh, multi-resource consensus. Suppose you want to build a protocol which uses proof of stake, proof of space, proof of work, all combined into one protocol. And you want this protocol to work even if you have a majority of proof of work miners being malicious, as long as like a very small fraction of proof of stake miners are not malicious. So you can, and characterizing what are the trade-off regions, what sets of adversary uh, ratios can you stabilize across these multiple resources. So we did a bunch of work on consensus protocols, uh, also on peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, how do you design peer-to-peer -to -peer topologies adaptively? How do you make sure that, you know, in a blockchain, when you have a peer-to-peer -peer network, the consensus protocol respects the ordering of messages in the peer-to-peer -peer network? One of the things that's happening rampantly in blockchains is front running. And one way to, one type of front running you can call as non-targeted front running. You just want to go ahead of everybody else because you have a price advantage in doing so. And to prevent non-targeted front running, if the blockchain had some native first in, first out property, messages that came in first into the distributed system need to be executed first. How do you define it? How do you make sure you have a highly efficient protocol which achieves this? We have a recent paper called Themis which achieves this. Um, on top of the consensus protocol, you have scaling solutions, sharding. How do you create uh, codes that uh, ensure that you have uh, scalability? How do you do dynamic resource allocation? We had a couple of papers, coded Merkle tree and free to shard on that. Okay, so this just gives a background of the type of works we've done, and also as, uh, since I'm giving a talk in this research group, I want some of you who are interested in any of these topics to stop by and talk later. Okay, um, one, uh, while doing some of this research, I mean, we did talk to industry a bit, and some of our ideas are in, uh, integrated in some of these protocols, like Chia, for example, uses our consensus protocol in their proof of space uh, system, but one thing we found as a major friction in blockchain is the rate of innovation at the core layers, at consensus, sharding, peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, is way lower than the rate of innovation at the application layer. Because applications are permissionlessly deployable, anybody can come and deploy an application on top of an existing blockchain like Ethereum, whereas core protocol upgrades are permissioned in a very deep sense. You can say permissioned or democratic, but either way, very few innovations get in. So this has stalled our space quite a bit. And this has kind of bothered me the most because on the one hand, we see there's a massive wave of open and permissionless innovation in the DAP layer. 
but all of this is throttled because of the slow rate at which the core layers of the protocol have been able to get upgraded. So, this project eigenlayer is an attempt to resolve this core contradiction at the core of blockchain. We want to build permissionless systems, but there is no permissionless innovation at the base of these systems. How do we solve this? That is what we are trying to address here. Okay, so, zooming back, I am going to take the story back to 2009, 2008, 2009. Bitcoin pioneered decentralized trust and we all know this and the way this system is built is you have a layer of decentralized trust in Bitcoin it is done through proof of work mining. On top of this mining there is a consensus protocol for in Bitcoin the proof of work longest chain or heaviest chain protocol which then decides what the valid chain is. On top of this there is the Bitcoin script which sets the execution semantics what do bits that are committed on this blockchain mean? Oh, it means I can send you Bitcoin, whatever, you know, transaction types and so on. So, you know, the way we are organizing the blockchain stack, there is a trust layer at the base, there is a consensus layer on top, there is an execution layer on top of it. Okay, so Bitcoin pioneered this model, but Bitcoin also was an application specific blockchain. What do I mean by that? Bitcoin is specifically designed for one application, exchange of Bitcoin among clients, that is the primary application. And if you go back to like 2011, any new application that needed to be built on a blockchain needed its own trust network. For example, somebody wanted to build a domain name system, a decentralized domain name system called Namecoin. And if you wanted to build Namecoin, Bitcoin script does not give you enough programmability to start a new system for maintaining domain names and how they are allotted and so on. So, you have to create a new scripting layer, the Namecoin scripting layer. And, but it is not enough for you to create a new scripting layer, you have to create a new trust network, you have to create a new proof of work mining or use the same mining, but let a different group of miners mine and secure your network. There was no way to share trust between Namecoin and Bitcoin. Okay, so this is the story circa 2011-2012. Many other examples, ColorCoin, MetaCoin, you know, this was the Bitcoin talk era of like 2012. So, the picture is any new application needed to create its own decentralized trust network. Decentralized trust is an exotic variety of trust. It rarely is able to happen, like there, there should be very few decentralized trust networks. Whereas each application having to create its own decentralized trust network is clearly not the correct model. And many people realize this around this time. Most prominently Vitalik and friends who pioneered the notion of what I call modular blockchains. The core idea that was built by a by Ethereum was the idea of decoupling trust and innovation. What do I mean by that? What they actually did was something quite you know simple in a very basic sense. They just took the Bitcoin scripting layer and replaced it with a general purpose Turing complete programming layer, the Ethereum virtual machine. Okay? So, this was just a small technical upgrade in some sense. But what it did is created modularity of trust. Okay. What do I mean by that? Now that you have this Ethereum system, you anybody can come and build distributed applications, decentralized applications on top of such a system. So, the person building that innovation, the person who built ENS, the naming system that is now used in Ethereum did not have anything to do with this trust network, anybody can come and deploy dApps on top of this virtual machine, thus modularizing trust. So, the trust of Ethereum network became a module that can be supplied to any distributed application that wants to build on top. This has actually led to a massive acceleration of the pseudonymous economy. Why do I say that? I say that because anybody creating any of these applications they are not themselves trusted, they are just bringing innovation. You come up with an idea for how to build an Uniswap which is just a decentralized exchange and you can be a nobody, you do not need to be trusted, you just write your code, you put it up on Ethereum 
everybody trusts Ethereum will continue to execute the conditions as stated as long as you can understand the code. You don't need to know who, the, who created this distributed application. So this has led to a massive error of what we can call open innovation where anybody can come and contribute their innovation, plug it on top of this massive trust network and deploy it for anybody to use. So one way of modeling this is you think about the base layers, the trust network consensus and the virtual machine together bundled into a trust network and producing trust. So essentially the Ethereum blockchain is a producer of trust, decentralized trust, and the distributed applications are a consumer of trust. They consume trust and in return pay fees back. This is the value exchange. The value exchange is the dApps get trust from Ethereum and in return they pay fees back to Ethereum. This was the model. By creating this new economy where trust and innovation got decoupled, many more things became possible that were simply impossible in the previous era. Prior to Ethereum, if you, create, if you created Uniswap, you have to build your own trust network and you know how many people mine on that trust network, how big is it, depends on your own particular economy. Whereas the size of this trust network is universal. It's just shared and pooled across all the, all the applications that run on top of Ethereum. Okay. So just one high level analogy, just like venture capital was a massive innovation. It was the decoupling of capital and innovation. Ethereum decoupled trust and innovation. I don't need to be trusted. I just bring the innovation. Ethereum brings the trust and together we can create a product. So it's a, it's a serious upgrade, but the barriers to open innovation continues to persist. Okay, for example, you have this stack and I have an idea how to upgrade the Ethereum consensus protocol. Okay, let's say uh, it's 2019 and I came up with this avalanche consensus protocol and I want to just deploy it onto Ethereum. There is no way to do it, right? So you look at it and you say, Oh, if I wanted to create a different consensus protocol, because it has different properties, it has different latency, different assumptions, I'm simply unable to create it on top of this existing trust network. So what do I do? I go and create my own whole world, the era of alternative layer one blockchains. Different blockchains have different consensus protocols, different virtual machines, and, but each of them have to build their own new trust networks. This picture looks exactly like the 2011 picture of Bitcoin and Namecoin and ColorCoin, except now innovations that are at the level of dApps can simply build on top of Ethereum, but innovations that go deeper and touch the heart of the stack have to actually segment and create fragmented trusted ecosystems. Okay, so this leads to a double coincidence. If you want to start one of these ecosystems, it's not sufficient for you to have great technology. You also need to be able to bootstrap a decentralized trust network, which is you have to be an evangelist and all this. There is another layer at which we see this barrier to open innovation. Okay? So if you just abstract out Ethereum as basically supplying trust to the dApps, what we see is Ethereum does not supply trust to the dApps for anything that the dApp wants. It only supplies trust in block making. What is block making? Block making is transaction ordering and transaction execution. That's all that block making is. So dApps are able to borrow trust from Ethereum on this limited axis of transaction ordering and transaction execution. If they wanted trust on anything else, I want to read data from the internet. I want to read data from another blockchain. I want to run a different execution engine. I want to run um, a gaming engine. I want to run an authentication system. Any of these things, you have to create your own new trust network. A simple example is something like Chainlink. Chainlink is an Oracle protocol which helps fetch data from the internet into the blockchain. But Chainlink cannot be built on top of Ethereum natively. Chainlink has its own trust network. It has a set of smart contracts from which it brings the data into Ethereum, but the trust network is not, trust is not borrowed from Ethereum or stakers. 
trust is its own group of new middleware stakers. So each middleware creates, has to create their own decentralized trust network. Any other dimension that the dApps need in which they want to consume trust other than block making, they need other trust networks to supplant those actions. So the, the, I highlighted the bootstrapping problem that when you want to create these new middleware, for example, you not only need to have innovation, but you also need to have your own new trust network. And it's very difficult. And just take the example of Oracle's Chainlink is a market leader and you know it's worth whatever, $20 billion or something. And the second largest Oracle is like one hundredth as big as Chainlink. And part of the problem is you cannot bootstrap a new Oracle because you have to build your new trust network. It is not simply a matter of getting adoption. It is also a matter of bootstrapping your trust network. So one of the things I started seeing is that even though we think blockchains are creating an era of permissionless open innovation, there are the anything that requires its own trust network gets entrenched very deeply and it's very difficult to upgrade it and add on new innovations on top of this. Okay, so but I want to highlight what the microeconomic problem is on each of these different players in the current architecture. So the microeconomic problem is if you're running a middleware, let us say I'm running a middleware which is data storage. Claims that you know you give me data, I'm just going to store it and I'm going to have some crypto economic game to make sure that you're storing data. So I want to create a system like this. Um, for what I have to do is I have to usually create my own staking mechanism. Okay, so I create this like data storage token and let people get this data storage token and stake it. And by staking it, they're agreeing to provide service correctly. If they don't do provide service correctly, their staked tokens will be slashed or taken away. Okay, when you want to create a system like this, and you want high economic security, you want a lot of capital staked. And when you have a lot of capital staked, you have the opportunity cost of capital. And so for example, you want $10 billion staked in your data storage layer, because you, know, you want to have comparable security to Ethereum. Now, you have to pay a 10% or a 5% or something annual rate on that capital staked in order to sustain that staking group in a non-speculative world. Today people may, or you know, three months back people may have been buying these tokens and staking them because the token number go up. But you know, in a non-speculative world, you need to account for the cost of capital. So there is a massive cost problem in running the middleware. The cost problem is you are not bounded by the operational cost of storing data on end nodes. You are bounded by the cost of feeding a massive economic capital base. That's the dominant cost. So one thing as we were designing some of these protocols is I started finding that most of the real systems are not at all capped by operational cost. They're all capped by capital cost. And one way to know it in reality is you look at any proof of stake ecosystem, you see how much reward goes to the person who provides operations of staking versus how much reward goes to the person who holds the capital. 96% or 97% goes to the, or 94% goes to the person who holds the capital and only 6% goes to the person who actually does the operations. So it's all cost of capital. So even if you come up with a breakthrough idea for reducing the operational cost like 10x, it's still like the 94% remains unchanged. So this is a massive problem. So when you're designing middleware, your cost structure is actually capped by cost of capital. Okay. When you're, if you're a dApp, the microeconomic problem you're facing is you're paying a very high fee to a large trust network like Ethereum so that you're getting trust from them, but you're limited by the weakest trust that you're depending on. If you had an oracle which is not as trusted, if you had a bridge that is not as trusted, you could get rugged there. So your secure trust is always the least common denominator. So you, even though you're paying a high fee, the security premium for a better blockchain, you're not getting trust on all the dimensions that you want. Finally, as far as the core blockchain is concerned, there is also an economic problem. The economic problem is if the core value proposition of the blockchain is to provision decentralized trust and make revenue on it, 
Ethereum is only able to provision decentralized trust on block making, not on all the other things that may be required to run a decentralized service. So what is happening is there are islands of decentralized trust that are being created by other middlewares. And instead of the revenue aligning and creating a massive trust network, revenue gets fragmented into smaller islands, fragmenting trust for the ecosystem as well as losing to a value, uh, a value misalignment to the core ecosystem. Okay, it's actually a ridiculously simple idea that solves these problems all at one go. Okay, the solution is called Eigenlayer. Um, it is a mechanism to leverage an existing trust network to do other things. I want to leverage an existing trust network to do other things it was not intended to do. Okay, that's it, that's the core idea. How do we do it? I'll get into that. Okay, so Ethereum supplies trust on ordering and execution as we said earlier. Eigenlayer is a series of smart contracts on Ethereum. Okay, and what it lets you do, the core operative word here is restaking. That's the new idea, restaking. What is restaking? Restaking is so when we're talking about Ethereum, we're talking about proof of stake Ethereum. In my mind, already we are in the proof of stake world, right? It needs to happen. But already, for example, several tens of billions of dollars, maybe 30 or 40 billion dollars is already staked in the Ethereum proof of stake network called the beacon chain, which is just a run in to actually start running the proof of stake network. So there is already a lot of stake locked up in Ethereum. So what is Eigenlayer? Eigenlayer is a mechanism by which stakers stakers restake what is restake restake is they put the same capital at additional risk same capital additional risk okay so they lock the stake in ethereum the same stake they commit to additional slashing conditions slashing is a mechanism by which your stake can be taken away but you add additional reasons by which you can be penalized your stake can be penalized that's what you commit on top of these smart contracts on Eigenlayer. We do not need liquid staking solutions. I'll come to address that point. But right now I'm stating the property, I'll state the mechanism next. The property that we want is the same stake it takes on additional risk. And additional risk on what? On providing any new services that have been built on top of Eigenlayer. Any new services. Somebody wants to come and build an oracle, somebody wants to come and build a bridge, somebody wants to build a data availability layer, somebody wants to build a new consensus protocol. Any of these can be built on top of Eigenlayer. Okay. If you are a staker and you are opting in to Eigenlayer, you also specify which subset of services you are opting in to provide trust for. You may say, oh, I like the oracle project because I'm getting X revenue and need to do X work and that's good enough for me. So I'm opting into the Oracle, but I'm not opting into whatever this fair ordering or some other service. So as a staker, you can specify which subset of services you are opting into and that therefore gaining revenue and also potentially taking additional slashing risk on. Okay. So now let's see how this aligns everybody in the ecosystem correctly. First, if you are a middleware, okay, let's say I'm running an oracle and a staker who's already staked in Ethereum has to opt in to the also provide services on this oracle. They do not have an additional cost of capital. They're already staked on Ethereum and earning APR or whatever on top of it. And you cannot do much else with that stake. So by opting in to Eigenlayer, the marginal cost of capital that you're incurring is either very small or you can say theoretically zero. Of course, there is a slashing risk that you have to account for. But if you know that whatever middleware that you're opting into, if you're an honest node, you will never get slashed, then that slashing risk is either zero or minimized based on whatever smart contract risk and other platform risks that may be there. But the marginal cost dynamic of a staker is fundamentally 
hey, what is the operational cost of running this middleware? And am I getting enough revenue for doing it? If the marginal operational cost is justified by the revenue that I'm getting on that middleware, I will opt in. It's a very simple equation. So the cost structure of middleware suddenly transforms from a capital limited to an operational cost limited. So this is extremely valuable. If you want to come and build a new Oracle, you know, you don't have to worry about how am I going to compete with Chainlink who has a $20 billion at stake. That is $40 billion at stake on Ethereum and you can get them to opt into your Oracle and start providing services. Okay, as far as the dApps are concerned, especially services which are very popular, which many stakers will opt into, you're fundamentally getting the same trust as Ethereum itself if all stakers potentially opt in. So you could get the core Ethereum trust on services that were not natively built into Ethereum. And finally, it's extremely value aligned to the core ecosystem, to Ethereum itself. Why? Because not only is it giving additional yield opportunities for the stakers, people who have staked on Ethereum get block rewards and transaction fees, but they can also get Oracle fees and data availability fees and ordering fees and all these other things that were unavailable to them earlier. So the fact that you have potential additional sources of revenue for staking ETH increases the value of the token itself. So by kind of providing a mechanism by which you can supply this trust to other services and other people can create these services and it doesn't have to be created by one monolithic group and does not need uh, approval from anybody, basically creates permissionless innovation on top of a common layer. So Eigenlayer is a two-sided marketplace. One side is stakers opting in to, into this Eigenlayer. The other side is middlewares, services that are built on top of Eigenlayer opting in to use these stakers. Is this system assuming honest majority or is this system operating on crypto economic assumptions which is you can get slashed? I think that depends on the particular detail of middleware. As long as you can write an on-chain slashing contract. I'll give an example of where you can write a simple on-chain slashing contract. For example, you want to run a new blockchain on top of the same Ethereum trust network. Let's say I want to run a Solana on top of the Ethereum trust network. The Solana blockchain, the C-level virtual machine and whatever other consensus protocols. I want to run this on top of Ethereum. One of the core slashing condition in a protocol like this is if I double sign a block. At the same depth of a block, I sign two different uh, a staker signs on two different blocks. This is a very easily on-chain verifiable slashing condition. Then that set of nodes gets slashed. So we do not have to make an assumption that people are going to behave honestly. All we need to make uh, all the statements, the type of statements we are shooting for, if they did something wrong on your protocol, X dollars going to get burnt. So that's the type of crypto economic statements we want to make. If they did something bad to you, X amount of dollars getting burnt at stake. So, so that's the kind of assumptions we are shooting for. We do not require the transference of majority honest assumptions. There are certain things for which you cannot write on-chain slashable contracts. This goes back to the discussion we had earlier in the morning here. For example, threshold signing or threshold revealing and stuff like that, there is no clear way to do slashing. For those things, you may be happy with saying that, hey, you know, it's the Ethereum stakers that are doing it and I'm happy to get a majority trust from them. But many, many use cases actually you can write sharp on-chain slashing contracts. For example, if I'm writing an Oracle, Oracle is one of the harder cases, but in, if, when you want to build an Oracle, you and I may reasonably agree that we will get slashed if I bring in a price feed which differs significantly from a Coinbase and a Binance and a FTX or whatever price feeds. Whereas that kind of an assumption cannot be done at the base layer of a protocol. But as an opt-in layer, you and I may agree that that's a slashing condition that we've opted into which becomes on-chain verifiable. So there are certain things which are on-chain verifiable, there are certain, certain things which are not and each middleware has to design for this correctly. So if 
to the extent that your feature is on-chain verifiable, to that extent you get crypto economic guarantees rather than majority trust guarantees. And you're getting the, potentially if all each stakers opt in, like I've come up with let's say a much better protocol than all these consensus protocols on a virtual machine, I don't have to go like figure out how to like shill a new token and make it worth 40 billion for the system to be useful. I just need to convince the, these ETH stakers to opt in and run this new chain. And as, as I run this new chain, it does, it's not security limited anymore, it's adoption limited. And it transforms the dynamics of creating new distributed systems. So that's, that's the idea. So other than that, there is no tethering to Ethereum. But because it is Ethereum adjacent, for example, flashing contracts and other things are there on Ethereum, you can actually start interoperating with Ethereum much more fluidly than if you are a separate chain. Transaction fees, for example, goes, you could, you could do many things. You could create your own new token and this token is used for like, be, it is the fee payment mechanism in your system and you use the same tokens to also reward the Ethereum restakers in Eigenlayer. It's a free market. Eigenlayer, so the way Eigenlayer works is you come in and say here is a new service and here is the reward risk dynamic of this service and stakers opt in whether they like it or not. They're just voting yes or no on this free market. So you can specify what the reward mechanism is. Reward mechanism could be something different. It, you don't need a new token, you just create, transaction fees are paid to the ETH stakers. Perfectly fine. If you're, an, if you're building an oracle, you may say that anytime anybody queries the oracle, that fee directly goes to the ETH stakers. So you can create your own like economic models on top of this, but even just that one thing, the fact that you can pay in arbitrary tokens rather than using only Ethereum is itself a value proposition to run like interesting things on top. So how Eigenlayer works, it does not require something like liquid staking. What you do is you go and deposit your ETH into the Ethereum smart contracts and in the Ethereum smart contracts you have something called withdrawal credentials. Who has the power to withdraw the stake from the native staking. And we said, so if you want to participate in Eigenlayer, you set the withdrawal credential to the Eigenlayer smart contracts. And by doing this, Eigenlayer has withdrawal power to withdraw your stake whenever. And therefore, when it withdraws the stake, you may not get back your entire stake if you did something bad in Eigenlayer. So, and to the extent that everything is written on chain and verifiable, all slashing conditions are written on chain and verifiable, you're not trusting me or anybody for the correctness of these slashing conditions. So you opt into Eigenlayer, you agree to these slashing contracts and your is stake being over leveraged and how do I know if it's being over leveraged? I think that's the question. And to give a very concrete example, Let's say there are 10 different apps which are running their own chains. Now there is a kind of trend people are thinking about each dApp may have its own chain because it doesn't have to suffer fee congestion from other things happening. Like recently there was this ApeCoin and BAYC had this, you know, created some externalities to the rest of the system. So each dApp could potentially be running its own chain. And let's say you have a dApp and you think that, hey, I have like, one million dollar in like value in this and I'm happy if like two million dollar is staked in this system. And, but it turns out 10 of these dApps, each of them have one million dollar in value, rely on the same two million dollar quorum, thus this stake became over leveraged. So this is the scenario of concern and we're very much of course worried about this scenario. And this is why Eigenlayer itself is also the risk management layer. So what do we do? We can actually model this problem graph theoretically. You, each staker is a node and each service depends on a bunch of stakers and has a condition that if more than 60% of the stakers cheat or whatever, that service kind of collapses and there is a profit from corrupting that service. Each service declares what this profit from corruption is. We have this two-sided graph. There's a profit from corruption for each service and there's how much is staked by each of these stakers. And then you can calculate cuts on this graph which say that if you, if you remove some bunch of stakers out, they collude together, then this much of stake gets burnt, and this is the, TV, you know, this is the uh, profit from corruption, total profit from corruption, and we want to keep this graph stable. It's a beautiful combinatorics problem. I think you guys will, will like it a lot. We don't have an exact solution for it, but we have sufficient conditions, 
and actually uh, mechanisms by which we make sure that the system is never over leveraged. Uh, one thing is you know we haven't analyzed this scenario this uh, gaming scenario of uh, TVL itself because the, the neutral assumption is that TVL or total value locked in any of these contracts is kind of verifiable right. But if somebody randomly under declares the TVL so over declaring TVL is you are just like more conservative but if you under declare your TVL then there could be some issues. We have not analyzed whether that leads to a contagion or contained attacks only on your system. The ideal would be that only your system gets attacked right ok. So, uh, having said all this the really useful use case for eigenlayer is when almost everybody can run everything ok. This is actually you know one would think that this is the most over leveraged everybody running everything right. But this is actually the best case scenario that you actually want. In fact, what it does is it massively deleverages systemic risk as of what is existing today. Let me explain. Uh, on the left side what you see is you have a dApps and there are like three middlewares. Each of these middlewares have 1 billion dollar at stake and there is a layer 1 which is has 10 billion dollar stake just some hypothetical examples and every dApp design, depends on all these middlewares some oracle, some bridge something right. And on if, if you had this picture and all these middlewares wares mission critical which means if you attack them you can kind of tank the dap. Then what is the cost of corrupting this left side ecosystem is just corrupt one of these middlewares. The cost of corruption on this system is the min of all these numbers ok. Let us see what happens in an eigenlayer world. In an eigenlayer world let us assume that all stakers provide services on all these middlewares the fully over leveraged example. What happens in this case is if everybody is providing service on every one of these middlewares now to attack the dap you need to attack a majority of all the stakers ok. And the interesting thing is how much staking will be supported on this summed up system is actually the sum of all the staking that was supported on all these systems. Why? Because each of them were enough to sustain a 5 percent or 10 percent APR on the fees that it was getting on each of these systems. So, what happens is you are moving from the min norm the minimum of all the things that you are depending on to the sum of all the things that you are depending on if every staker can run every service that is really huge. So, it massively reduces systemic risk from being the least common denominator to all services being commonly provisioned by one ecosystem. When is this feasible? This is feasible when middleware are designed to be scalable horizontally scalable as you get more and more nodes the per nodes workload goes down then actually everybody will opt into everything because the operational cost of opting in is very low and you are actually just uniformly dividing it by n nodes. So, when middlewares have scale out economics then actually we expect basically every staker will opt into everything ok. So, all right. So, eigenlayer is the restaking collective a mechanism by which you opt in it is kind of become like a layer directly on top of the staking layer and this restaking collective enables you to pass this trust beyond the limited confines of protocol upgrades. Basically now you can build any new blockchain that you want a new virtual machine, new consensus protocols, new data availability layers all of these things into uh, on top of eigenlayer rather than having to go and build separate blockchains for each of them. So, instead of having, having open innovation only at the dap layer you have open innovation across all layers of the ecosystem where you are sharing a common trust network and there, therefore reusing this for any new innovative services that you are building. And uh, just a note here that we do not need access to things like liquid staking derivatives even though we can use them. And finally, it lets 
each node permissionlessly opt in to a subset of services that they are most interested in. Okay, so I think this is repeated. Um, I'll just briefly touch upon for some of you who may have been familiar with uh, the evolution of this idea is origins is called merge mining. What is merge mining? So let's look at a proof of work system. In a proof of work system, if you want to run the system, there are two different costs. One is the mining cost and the other is the validation cost. And the mining cost, which is the cost of solving the proof of work puzzle, far dominates the validation cost. And one idea is can I amortize this mining cost across many, many different systems where you're validating things. And indeed people tried this so that the per blockchain you know, mining cost actually goes down. But there is a significant problem is that the crypto economics, the economic incentives do not transfer to the merge mined systems. You can, if you merge mine an altcoin along with Bitcoin, even if 100% of Bitcoin miners opted into the altcoin mining, they can attack the altcoin without taking any significant damage because the Bitcoin price is not affected and their mining equipment most definitely is not affected. So while merge mining was a good idea for amortization, it failed in the economic incentives that, uh, that accompany it. Our core understanding is merge staking. Merge staking completely transforms this economics. In a proof of stake system, the less appreciated fact is the dominant cost is not validation cost. It is the capital cost of staking. And this is really dominant. And if you want to amortize this capital cost, what you're doing is you basically use the same stake, merge stake across many, many systems. By merge staking, do you suffer the same problem that merge mining suffered? No, it turns out it's the opposite. You actually get perfect crypto economic transfer. What do I mean by perfect crypto economic transfer? If you have 5% of Ethereum stakers operating on your protocol, you have the economic security of that 5%, which is significantly better than, uh, than the crypto economics of merge mining. Also, the other fact is if only 4% of Bitcoin miners mined your system, you have no economic security. Whereas if 4% of stakers just opt in, there's only one, your system, which is merge staking on, on top of Ethereum, you get economic security, which is a transformational idea. It, it's actually, that's why I said this is really like a really, really simple idea, but it's just not been thought about before. I think partly because of the path dependence and people got burnt with merge mining. More than solving the economic problems, uh, Eigenlayer also solves some of the ecosystem problems. One of the problems is the question of block space. Okay, so what is block space? Block space is basically each blockchain, because it has finite resources, has you know, only a certain maximum size of the block that it can accommodate. The size could be measured in you know, bytes or it could be measured in some computational units. But today, we, we are starting to see, for example, Ethereum block space is starting to command a lot of premium. It is one of the most valuable commodities in blockchain. So the economics of block space it is determined by its relationship to block limit. What is the block limit? Block limit is the maximum size that a block can be. And all of these systems have self adjusting economics by which as your block size gets closer and closer to the block limit, your price starts exploding so that the system is, doesn't go over capacity. Okay, so that's the basics of block space. If block space is, and having more block space is in general good because you can build more and more interesting applications. Even today morning we were talking about auctions and you know, whether it's 2.5 million gas or 5 million gas, it's only 300 milliseconds on, or like three milliseconds on a computer, we should be able to run it. And it's not possible today. I'll explain precisely why and how Eigenlayer completely transforms the economics here. Okay, you look at the notional block space or the maximal block space that a node can run. Okay, one way to think of it in very concrete terms is what is the bandwidth that a node has? Okay. And that determines, that puts a limit on block space. 
the x-axis is replicas or nodes, different nodes have different potential amounts of processing power or bandwidth, let us say. Different nodes have different bandwidths. The, x, the y axis is just block space, you can think of it now measured in bandwidth. Okay. There are some nodes which have very low bandwidth and some nodes which have much higher bandwidth. Okay. And how is the block limit determined? How do you determine the maximum bandwidth that you should consume as a blockchain? What you do is you set an entry restriction called block limit. You say that I want to at least, I want to admit, for example, Ethereum's philosophy is I want to admit a home validator in Venezuela. That is what I want. So, 1 megabyte per second may be okay. So, you go and say that is the block limit. I am going to set my block limit so that a 1 megabyte per second guy can participate in the system. So, that is how you set block limit. So, block limit is set by the weakest nodes infrastructure, the weakest nodes infrastructure to participate in the ecosystem. Now, what we realize is all of us using Ethereum are paying because of this guy, the one guy in Venezuela we want to accommodate. Even though this guy has 1 megabyte per second, all of the guys stakers running on Ethereum or on Amazon Web Services or all nodes or Chorus 1 or Figment, any of the staking services actually have 10 gigabits per second connection. That is like a 1000 or 10,000 x difference in the computational resources between the, the powerful guys here and the last guy here. And block limit is determined by the weakest node you want to admit. So, part of this is the paradigm of blockchains today where it is a completely homogeneous system. It does not matter whether you are talking about Ethereum or you are talking about a Solana. In Solana, the entry limit instead of being kept at 1 megabyte per second is kept at 50 megabytes per second or 100 megabytes per second. But it is still if instead of having 100 megabytes per second you had 10 gigabytes per second you can do nothing more on the Solana system. So, all blockchains today are determined or are designed for a homogeneous ecosystem, homogeneous staker ecosystem. Whereas, in reality stakers are highly heterogeneous. Okay. How do we solve this problem? We do not need to do anything more, Eigenlayer automatically solves this problem by creating a free market by which these same stakers can lend out their additional block space for other services built on top of Eigenlayer. For example, in this system, somebody will come and build another chain which instead of having 15 million gas per block, will have 15 giga gas per block because you know these stakers can opt in and get a different security. You do not get the entire Ethereum security, you get like a 60 percent of Ethereum security and that is already good enough. And I, I just want to make one comment that there is, it is not all about economic security, there is a regime where you need decentralization, that is for censorship resistance. Because whether your transaction got censored or not is not a slashable offense. So, what we really like is you have a decentralized base station like Ethereum, which provides a layer of censorship resistance on top of which you can build any other service and you can use Ethereum as a backstop for censorship resistance. If a transaction is returned on Ethereum, you are forced to include it in your side chain or whatever other service. So, by having this separation that Ethereum becomes the censorship resistance layer and therefore, keeping the node restrictions very low and on top of which you can construct high power systems which can still get a lot of the economic security and have insane computational liabilities. This is a transformation of block space. Okay. Staker heterogeneity extends beyond computational abilities. Stakers are heterogeneous not only in how much block space they have, they are also highly heterogeneous in their risk and reward preferences. You and I may agree that we will get slashed if we differ from a Coinbase you know API, uh, uh, API output whereas, some for somebody else that will be completely unacceptable. So, stakers are highly heterogeneous in their risk taking abilities and in their beliefs on the world and therefore, this can never be normalized into a core protocol, but can be externalized into an opt in layer. So, stakers are heterogeneous in risk taking abilities, stakers are also heterogeneous in reward preferences. For example, beyond, so in Ethereum block is thought of as a colorless quantity. 
all transactions are equal and the only signal you use to distinguish transactions is price. Whereas, this creates to all kinds of interesting problems. Like for example, it is very difficult to build a social network on top of Ethereum, even if Ethereum had much more block space, because every social network transaction is competing with a DeFi transaction, which is much more profit and loss on a transaction by, by transaction basis, but on a 10 year horizon, the social network may win out. So there is no ability for stakers to express their coloring preferences that they would much rather bet on a social network than on a financial system. So our solution is they opt into different subchains, different layers on top of the core layer in which they have different reward preferences. You get paid in this new social token and you're betting that this social network is going to grow. So Eigenlayer maximizes staker heterogeneity and creates a free market instead of having a minimum common denominator market. Okay, so finally, it solves the one problem that has been bugging me for four and a half years, which is how do you design a blockchain which is both democratic and agile in its way of innovation? So here is a plot. The two axes is you have x-axis is governance. Is governance democratic or autocratic? And the y-axis is, is the rate of innovation agile or stable or slow? Right. Something like Ethereum is very democratically governed, but is also very, very slow to respond to new re requirements in the market. All protocols today, I'll claim, are making a trade-off between agility and democratic governance. There's a trade-off between governance being democratic versus the rate of innovation. And this is a significant problem for blockchains if you want to take the thesis of permissionless innovation. Ethereum plus eigenlayer actually gets the best of both worlds. You have a base layer which is democratic, which is slowly updated, which is stable over long time frames, on top of which on eigenlayer people can build many new innovations which respond very quickly to market demands in a completely permissionless innovation. Actually, I would even say that Ethereum plus eigenlayer pushes this all the way up here. So this is the rate of democratic innovation. This is the rate of monopolistic innovation. This is the rate of permissionless innovation. And because the upgrade on BSC needs to be shipped by the CTO at BSC or something. Whereas an upgrade on Eigenlayer can be shipped by anybody who's interested in shipping an upgrade. So, okay. So I think I'll conclude the talk with this. Um, it's, I just gave a hint of what kind of things can be built. We are exploring building bridges, building event-driven automation, fair ordering services, side chains, and all kinds of other interesting things like how do you prevent, prevent or integrate MEV into the blockchains. All of these systems can be start, built on Eigenlayer. Eigenlayer is already live in our internal test nets. You can deposit things like liquid staking derivatives. You can deposit into the, uh, into the Ethereum beacon chain and opt into Eigenlayer. And not only that, we have actually already built the first use case for Eigenlayer, which is a hyperscale data availability layer for Ethereum. Uh, I will not be able to talk about it now, but I can tell you that it is basically a da data availability layer. This is one of the biggest problems in Ethereum scaling today. You have rollups which write, which offload computation and uh, memory but cannot offload uh, network bandwidth. All of the data has to be committed on top of Ethereum in order to make sure that they are secure. And instead, we have an ETH restake layer called data layer, which actually does all of it, but incorporates some of the best ideas in erasure coding, polynomial commitments, to actually get a hyperscale data availability layer. It already gets you a rate at which you can write data into this layer is on our testnet 12.4 megabytes per second which is 10x larger than Ethereum 2, which is scheduled to sh ship in two years. So I'll stop the presentation at this. Uh, happy to take any questions. So like, if I like deployed an item layer and I was like happy with whatever risk like your graph cal like calculates, right? And then say like, 
10 more things deployed in that changes algorithm. But assume like the API yeah. actually report that, and now that the risk has changed. So the way you would solve the problem if you're over leveraged is by increasing your fee, more people will opt in into your layer and you'll get under leveraged again. So that's the dynamics that we're anticipating. If I'm the developer, this clearly seems better for me because I can leverage this capital so I can build my own. I feel like that, that was pretty interesting. As, so now I'm wondering, like, as the Ethereum network, that like, currently they're in this great situation where they're like, really under leveraged. They have so much capital, and the amount of damage you can do on Ethereum with all that capital is not a whole lot. So I'm wondering, sort of like, as like, like even if there's hundreds of people who are already in a stable state, yep. that every new person that gets added, like, do I need to be concerned that like a new person who gets added did something dumb in their protocol, and now the state that used to be securing me and used to be stable is now? Yeah, I, I think one way of thinking about it is if you go back like three years, the Ethereum stake uh, supported like a, maybe a hundred million dollar DApp ecosystem, and today the DApp ecosystem has gone like thousand x. And the Ethereum stake has grown 1,000x. This is exactly what we expect will happen to this ecosystem. As more and more services start opting in, the yield opportunities go up. And as the yield opportunities are going up, basically more, more capital gets locked in. Instead of like 5% of ETH getting locked in to stake, you may have like 50% of ETH getting locked in to, to provide services. No, so, so I follow that, but like what, if, you know, like what happened with like the DAO or whatever, that it was just like a huge, wildly costly mistake. Like if someone, you know, like it's, it's, it's one thing that was completely separate from the consensus layer, right? But like, it's another thing if, um, you, you know, like if- Yeah, it, yeah, so there are like, I think it's, a, it's an important problem. And the problem is, okay, let's start from the point of view of the staker. The point of view of the staker is, somebody came up with a new middleware, right? And it's giving me X yield, do I opt in or not? And Okay, if it's just yield and not much risk, then you opt in. That's the, you know, now that all DeFi yield is drying up, people will opt in when there is additional actual, like genuine way to earn more yield. But the, the risk that is very hard for them to understand today is, is this middleware have like smart contract errors, distributed system issues that basically could slash an honest note. That's where I think all of that problem, if you just want to remove, abstract it, I think one way of expressing that problem is that. I think what we need is, uh, just like there is a smart contract audit ecosystem, we need these like middleware audit ecosystems. And my general thesis for it is, smart contract audit is serving users who are supposed to like know nothing, and middleware audit is serving stakers who are supposed to know something. If we can't get middleware audits to work, we should not really be trusting smart contract audits. So that's my high level of why I think it's okay, but you know, it's not an answer to this problem. The problem is fundamentally, if all stake, the, the extreme example of your case would be all stake opted into an eigenlayer uh, system where you can get slashed, like even without actually doing anything bad, and then you got slashed and now the whole protocol's at risk. It's possible. It's possible and so, Whatever these new middlewares are, need to be like more and more. And I think, you know, in these scenarios, there is a tragedy of the commons, but there is also, the stakers are actually the ones who are losing their money. So they should have been more careful in actually opting in. And how do we make it easy for them to be more careful? That's all that we are focusing on. Using L1 block space. It depends on what you're doing. So the scaling part is not the same as moving to L1. So let me give a very concrete example. I just mentioned the data availability layer. But basically, what do I mean by scalable middleware? The data availability layer is a great example of a scalable middleware, where each node, so if I'm downloading, if I want to store a file size of size F, instead of each node storing and downloading the file, that's what happens today in Ethereum, what you would do is each node only stores roughly one over N of the file size in an erasure coded thing. They receive like, um, a proof that this chunk corresponds correctly to some polynomial commitment, and they all sign off on that commitment, and if enough people sign off on that commitment, you think that that data is available. So this has a self-scaling economics, because the total cost of storing a file is just a constant. It's actually two. It's like as though two nodes are storing a file, because each node is only storing two over n of the file. So 
The total cost of storing a file does not depend on the number of nodes that are opted in. But the price you can charge for it depends on the number of nodes because you're giving more economic security. So what happens is there is a self-scaling economics by which more and more nodes will opt in because you know, they can charge a security premium without increasing the cost of operations. The cost is constant. So basically what is happening is the erasure code breaks all trade-off between scalability and decentralization. You can get full decentralization and full scalability simultaneously because as you have, you have n nodes, you get the security of n nodes, but you get the cost of only storing on two nodes. So that's like full scalability and full decentralization simultaneously. And by using layers like this, you can actually like solve it without requiring each node to like provision more and more bandwidth or more and more storage space. So that's one way of scaling. Another way of scaling is I just want to take the Solana away, right? I just want to run like, you know, at a much higher like block space than what Ethereum is comfortable with. By that, I will cut out the home validator in Venezuela. Yes, but you know, the 30% of people who can actually opt in are enough and they provide enough economic security for me. And as long as for them, the opt-in the opt cost or operational cost is less than what uh, revenue they're making, they're happy to opt in. So these are different types of scaling and we are just a layer on which you can build arbitrary distributed systems on Ethereum. That's, you want to build your secure multi-party computation, you want to build your fully homomorphic system, you want to build some other crazy thing that you have, you can just leverage Ethereum trust to actually do it, rather than having to go and bootstrap your own trust. And the, now what happens is there's a competition between scalable middleware that's built on top and non-scalable middleware, and because of the operational cost advantages of scalable middleware, we expect they will win out completely over non-scalable. Yes. So they is thinking of your system as a, uh, you know, a not talk of this people say right. side chain because that allows for like multi for locking your state into multiple side chains. Is this a conceptual very quick thing about? That's one use case of Eigenlayer. You can also build things that are simply not a, or additional services on a, on Ethereum, like Oracles, right? Oracle is not a side chain. So the difference between having a sidechain and an ETH restaked sidechain, an eigenlayer sidechain, is you don't need a new token of value. You don't need to pay to maintain the cost of capital of that token of value. You're just like amortizing that over all these other things that other people do. Thank you.